is April the 4th, 2024. And as you can tell, I'm inside today. Um, it is a really, really windy day out there again today. Um, and it's actually gotten pretty cold. This weather cannot make up its mind. Uh, not yesterday, but the day before, it was really warm. When I took my kids out to that uh, plantation and... Um, Yesterday was pretty warm as well. It wasn't as warm as the day before, but today is it's gotten pretty cold out there, and the wind is is really really blowing hard. Um, but today's topic, um, I want to talk about the things that I noticed before I got diagnosed, and I've done a, a couple of videos like this in the past, but. Um, with the way this channel keeps growing, uh, we have so many new subscribers here. And a lot of people just aren't gonna go back and look at all those old videos. Um, and the reason I wanna talk about this today is uh, <clears throat> I haven't felt very good today. Um, today's been one of those days, you know, I have them every, you know, every so often where it's just, I get nauseated, uh, you know, every day, but there are days where it's just, you know, it just takes over and uh, I'm already on my uh, third nausea pill for today. I woke up this morning and I just felt horrible and uh, it's been like that all day today. Uh, as you can probably tell from my voice, I just don't feel all that hot. Um, but <clears throat> it really made me start thinking today uh, with the way that I've been feeling about uh, some of the things that I was going through before my diagnosis and especially uh, the nausea um, You know and like I said, there are so many new subscribers here. I get so many questions all the time every day from people uh, You know wanting to know uh, Certain things about you know what I noticed uh, before my diagnosis. Did I have this or did I have that? Um, so I just wanted to talk about some of the things today that uh, I was picking up on things I was starting to notice before my diagnosis um, and one of the major things that I was uh, dealing with daily uh, was the nausea and it wasn't just nausea I was I was vomiting as well and um, you know that's one of the, the really uh, one of the really bad things that happens you know with addiction is that you know that you know you're not you're not well and you continue um, to consume whatever that substance is, and especially alcohol, uh, you know, you just feel just horrible. But you know that, um, you know, one of the only ways you're going to feel better is to, to drink more. And that would, you know, every day I would wake up pretty much and uh, I would throw up. And it, that didn't, it wasn't like that forever. Um, Towards the end of my drinking is when it really started getting bad. And uh, like I said, I would wake up every single day and the first thing I would do was I would vomit. And the nausea would just continue throughout the day. And thinking about how, how addicted I really was, uh, putting that poison in my body, even though I felt so bad, um, just shows how powerful the addiction can be. And I'm sure there's a lot of you out there who know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, when you're when you are trying to force something down just so you can feel okay again because the withdrawals are coming on so strong and you're shaking. I would wake up every single morning shaking. Uh, I mean, it, 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 I would shake so bad that I could barely even hold a cup in my hand because my hands would be shaking so bad. Uh, I couldn't fill the cup all the way up. Um, you know, only about halfway full because my hands would shake so bad that it would splash out. And I often think about, uh, you know, towards the end and how bad it really was. And it, it was. It was horrible. And I remember that feeling of, um, you know, just be, being extremely nauseated and throwing up. And then as soon as I did, you know, the first thing that I would do is, uh, you know, make myself a glass of liquor and and drink it. And I had to physically force it down. Um, it's not like I was able to just drink it. Uh, I had to really, really. And 
I've talked about this before as well, but there's a guy on here um, on YouTube, his name's Scott Frieda, and he does uh, shorts a lot of times, and he does these reenactments of, you know, like, s s standing over a sink and trying to take a drink, and he starts to dry heave as he's doing that, and I've said this before, but man, that is just so realistic. That was what I was doing every single day, every single day. Um, just thinking about it makes me sad because of how sick I really was. And I thought that drinking more was gonna solve that. And just trying to force that stuff into my body, my body was trying to reject it and tell me no more. And instead, because of my addicted mind, um, I would, I would force it down. And it, 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 just thinking back on that, it, it just disturbs me. Um, because I know there's a lot of people out there who are doing that. There, that guy, Scott, that's on here, I mean, he, he didn't, you know, come up with that, uh, you know, just out of the blue. Um, obviously, uh, he was doing that or he saw somebody doing that or whatever, but <clears throat> when, when, when you're that deep into the bottle, uh, that's what ends up happening. And um, that was one of the main things that uh, happened to me towards the end of my addiction. It was just the constant throwing up. Um, I would wake up in the morning and throw up. Uh, later on in the day, usually somewhere around lunchtime, um, I would end up getting so sick I would throw up again. Um, and, and then a lot of times I would end up throwing up in the afternoon as well or at night uh, after I drank a whole lot. Um, you know, the, it wasn't just that either, uh, you know, the, the constant nausea, vomiting, um, but the pain in my right hand side, uh, my upper right quadrant where my liver is, um, I had a constant dull pain there all the time. And I knew that that, that meant something. Um, but once again, uh, that's the, the addicted mind, um, you know, going, oh, it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, I would make all these excuses up in my brain, you know, maybe I'd stretched wrong or laid the, in the bed the wrong way that night. Um, but in the back of my head, I always knew that it, it was my liver and it was causing problems. Um, but it, it, I, I constantly felt something there. And it was like, I, I don't, it's kind of hard to describe how that feels. Um, trying to put my finger on it. Um, I would get sharp pains there, but there was this, this constant like dull pain, uh, nonstop, always felt it. But it, it's like, like a pressure right here is the best way I could describe it. Um, like somebody was pushing on my stomach, uh, or like pushing from the outside. It, you just, I could just feel my liver is the only way I can really describe it. Um, I would get that all the time all the time and if i lay down on my bed and would rub right there or like push down on it it was really tender to the touch um and not just that but i could actually feel that my liver was swollen um i would lay down and right where my rib cage is if i laid down i could push right here and there wouldn't be anything really right there but on the right hand side i would i would feel like the the, the enlargement of my liver and it was past my rib cage. Um, now I don't have that much anymore. Uh, I still do sometimes will have that old feeling, um, but it's not like it was when I was drinking. Um, now this is another thing that I noticed and this was right towards, uh, actually this happened um, after I'd gotten sick initially and was went to the hospital. Um, and this is one of those things I really regret that happened. Um, I never sought medical help uh, because I just I just pushed it out of my head and I had stopped drinking at this point. Um, I would lay in the bed at night and I could push on my left side, but it was like down um, closer to the belt line. Um, but if I laid down, I could feel uh, that my spleen was swollen um, and it hurt. Uh, and I could, I could really feel it. I mean, there was a big ball right there. And I never said anything. Um, you know, I had quit drinking already at this point. Uh, 
you know, a matter of months had gone by uh, that I, you know, I, I had stopped. Um, now, I, I was working very hard at this point in time, too. Um, but I could really, really feel uh, a big knot in my stomach. And I would often rub it. My wife would ask me, what are you doing? I would just say, I don't know, something just kind of bothers me right there. But I never told her uh, that there was a lump there. And uh, come to find out, my, swing, my spleen, excuse me, was very, very, very swollen. Um, and uh, they ended up having to do a uh, splenic thrombosis. Uh, they had to cut off the blood supply to the spleen, to half of the spleen. Uh, I had a blood clot in, the, in my spleen and it enlarged. Uh, I think it was like four times its normal size. Um, and uh, that was a very painful uh, procedure that I had to go through. Um, I had to lay in the hospital for two weeks while my spleen died. And um, I can tell you guys, it's one of the most painful things I've ever been through, uh, was, going, was going through that. And they had gone through, uh, through my neck. Um, interventional radiology went in through my neck and they made a couple of incisions, went in there, they went through my groin. That's when they did the TIPS procedure, um, they also did that splenic thrombosis at the same time. Um, and I've talked about this, but the, that initial TIPS procedure was a failed procedure. They couldn't get through the blood clot in the portal vein, um, but they were able to uh, cut off the blood supply to the spleen. Um, and ever since I've had that surgery, my, I don't feel that knot there anymore. It's gone now. Um, but it's, that's a very, very common thing to happen with liver disease. Uh, you know, the, sw the spleen swelling up, um, blood clots in the spleen and the splenic vein, um, blood clots in the uh, portal vein. Um, these are very common. Portal hypertension, very, very common for liver disease. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this as well, but you know, when the liver starts to get scarred, the blood can't flow through it property, properly. It's, you know, I've talked about this before, but it's like uh, having a sponge. Uh, you know, if you've got a brand new sponge um, and you get it wet, the water's going to absorb right into it. Um, but if you've got an old sponge you've been using over and over again and it's gotten really hard and dried out, you try to put water on that, it doesn't absorb it very well. Um, so think of your liver as like a, a healthy liver be a brand new, uh, fresh sponge. Um, you know how sometimes you get that sponge that's a little bit moist when you open it out of the package? You put it in a sink, it man, it absorbs water right away. But an old sponge, you stick it underneath the water, it doesn't really absorb very well. You really got to kind of immerse it into the water to get it absorbed for a second. That's kind of like what your liver is like when uh, cirrhosis has gotten in. And um, that blood just can't flow through there, so it creates back pressure and your portal vein uh, gets hypertension. Um, which can lead to the varices and all that kind of stuff. Um, but like I said, uh, you know, I had constant uh, nausea and vomiting. Um, the spleen um, uh, was, was very swollen, and I never said anything about it. And if I had said something, um, they might have caught that a lot earlier, and I might have actually had a successful TIPS procedure initially. Um, because when they finally did find... Uh, when, when I went and actually uh, saw the hepatologist, uh, I had an MRI done with contrast. And uh, as soon as I walked into the hepatologist, and I had already been, um, my initial time in the hospital uh, was in uh, the end of May of 2022. And uh, I got out of the hospital at the end of May, uh, beginning of June. And um, I uh, only took off work uh, maybe a week uh, after I got out of the hospital. I went right back to work after that. Like I said, I owned my own business. Um, I went right back to work. I thought that everything was A-OK. -okay. Um, they hadn't initially told me I had cirrhosis at that point. Um, I knew that I had pancreatitis. Uh, they told me my liver numbers were elevated, but uh, no one had discussed cirrhosis with me at that point. Um, but when I, uh, when I got sick again and, um, September of 2022. Um, I'd quit drinking after the initial time getting sick, so I'd stop from uh, June, July, August, and then September. At the end of September, I ended up, on, I was on a job, and I ended up getting really sick, and um, 
I remember that day I came home. I was I was on a job. I actually had my daughter come out to help me on that job. And I initially told her, I said, I have to leave. I can't stay any longer. I need to go home. I don't feel well. So I left. I came home. And I'll never forget that day. I was driving home. I felt so bad. I, I felt horrible. And I didn't know what was going on. I didn't think it had anything to do with... Um, with my liver or pancreatitis or any of that kind of stuff. I thought I had the flu or something like that. That's how I felt. Uh, I was running a fever. I was really cold. Um, I was shivering. Um, it, it, I felt like flu-like symptoms. Um, I was really achy. Um, I came home that day, and as soon as I got home, I got in the bed, and um, I remember bundling myself up in the blankets. I was, I was just shaking. I was so cold. I was running a fever, and um, I went to sleep. And my wife came home that day, and you know she's like, "What's wrong?" And I said, "I think I've just got the flu." And uh, we just thought I was sick. Um, so the next day, uh, I actually the next day I had my wife and my daughter come with me to help finish up the job. It was a really big job I was trying to finish up, and it was a lot of money. And the the day before, I had gotten about half of it done. Um, we're talking about like a $2,000 job. I had to finish it. Um, so I had my wife and my daughter come help me. And um, I was in the middle of pancreatitis uh, on a really laborious job. <clears throat> and I, I finished it. I remember pushing myself through that that day um, really, really hard. I should not have been pushing myself like that. Um, but I just didn't know. And uh, I pushed and pushed and pushed, got the job done. I actually ended up leaving and left my wife and my daughter there and asked them to finish cleaning up so I could just go home. I came home that day. I laid back down in my bed. Um, I remember getting out of the bed. I was so cold. I, I made a really hot bath, got in the bathtub. And I'll never forget, I was laying in the bathtub and I started to throw up while I was in the bathtub. And my wife could hear me in there. She had come home at this point. And she could hear me in the bathroom throwing up. And I was, I, I remember laying in the bath. I was just throwing up all over myself. And I didn't have anything in my stomach except for liquid. So I was just throwing up. And it was blue because I had been drinking Gatorade that day. Um, I was throwing up all over myself in the bathtub. And I couldn't get out. I felt so bad. My wife had to help me get out of the bathtub. I got back in the bed. And I slept for like two days. Um, and I just felt so, so, so bad. Uh... So I, I told my wife I need to go I need to go to the doctor and I think it, initially I'd gotten sick on a Friday I finished up the job that Saturday I ended up going to the doctor on Tuesday and I went to the doc in the box uh, showed up there um, doctor said the same thing because um, I've been vomiting uh, nonstop since that Friday and I told the doctor everything that had been going on he asked if I had been drinking anymore and I told him no I I, I haven't had a sip of alcohol since May and um, he's like well it must be you know either like a stomach bug or something like that but he said before you leave I want to do one more thing let's just check your um, blood sugar really quick so he took some blood and he left the room and uh, about 10 minutes later he walked in the room and he had a piece of paper in his hand with a number written down on it and he just it was folded in four ways and he had that little piece of paper and there was a number written on there and it said 491 i'll never forget that and it was written in pencil and he said uh this is your blood sugar right now he said how much have you had to eat today and i said i haven't eaten you know, in a few days uh, i've been so sick and the doctor said i need you to go to the emergency room right now uh he said it might not be anything but your blood sugar is elevated and i need you to go uh, you gotta get checked out. And when we left that dock in the box, on the way to the emergency room, I started to feel sick again. And I asked my wife to pull over on the side of the road so I could vomit. And when I did, uh, it was straight red blood. And uh, we went to the, I knew something was really wrong at that point. That was the first time I had thrown up blood since the initial time I'd gotten sick. And um, when I arrived at the emergency room, uh, they did a CAT scan. Um, I wasn't there for 15 minutes, and they had already determined that I had uh, pancreatitis again. And that's the time that I ended up, and I got very, very, very ill. Uh, that's, that's the sickest I've been, um, was that time. Uh, 
And that's the time I, I really almost lost my life. I ended up uh, getting ascites really, really bad. They had to put a pick line in because uh, my blood pressure had dropped so low. Um, when I when I went to the, there's like an outsourced uh, emergency room that's attached to the hospital, but it's a little bit further away. But we knew it was going to be easier to get in there. So the ambulance had to come get me and take me to the hospital. When I arrived at the hospital, it was pretty late at night. Uh, they took me to my room. Uh, when I arrived to my room, uh, the doctor, I, I'd asked the nurse, could I please have something to drink? Because I hadn't had anything to drink all day. And uh, the nurse said, yeah. She said, I'm not supposed to do this. But she got me a ginger ale. And I'll never forget the doctor walked in. And uh, when the doctor walked in the room, he, the first thing he did was he noticed the the glass or the cup sitting on the little table beside my bed. And he goes, what is that? And I told him, it's just ginger ale. And he said, you can't have anything to drink right now. And I begged and pleaded with him, please, I'm so thirsty. And he said, no, you can't have this right now, man. You're in the middle of pancreatitis. So he took my drink away from me and the nurse uh, came back in the room and um, we were talking for a second. I told her, I said, can, I, can you please give me something to throw up in? They have those little bags. And as soon as she handed me the bag, I threw up, and I threw up 500 cc's of pure red blood. I filled the bag completely up. And as soon as that happened, um, that's when everything just hit the fan. Um, I ended up, uh, my, my heart rate went through the roof, and my blood pressure dropped, like, way down. Um, as soon as that happened, um, they took me to the ICU. And when they took me to the ICU, a whole team of nurses came in. They stripped all my clothes off. Um, they scrubbed me down. They put those things on my legs, those uh, like massage things for the blood clots. They put those on my legs. They did a whole bunch of stuff. And the next morning I woke up and there was a doctor in the room and he had a couple of students with him. And um, they kind of draped over my head and they put this whole thing over me. And there was like a whole in the, the drape that they put over me. And he said, we're gonna be doing some, uh, putting in this pick line, uh, cause we have to administer medicine to get your blood pressure back up. Um, I didn't know what was going about to happen, but they actually uh, like poked a hole in my chest to put that pick line in. And I, I think it like goes like to your heart um, when they do that. I'm not uh, precisely sure on what, what, what that procedure is, but I know that they made a big hole in my chest, and I still have a scar from that to this day. Um, and then they put these like lines in there. Uh, and then after that's when um, I stayed. I stayed there that day. Uh, I remember my wife came up there, and we actually watched a movie together in the hospital. And we thought everything was going to be okay. And then uh, that night, um, one of the nurses who was friends with my brother. My brother's a nurse, and uh, him and this guy were really good friends. The guy came in and he said, "Hey." Um, I, I hate to tell you this, man, but we're going to have to ship you off to another hospital because we just can't handle what's going on with you. Um, at this point, they had gotten my numbers back. All my numbers were out of whack. My liver numbers were out of whack. Uh, my platelets were through the roof. Um, my hemoglobin, uh, I think it was like a four. Uh, it was really low. They had already started giving me blood transfusions at this point. Um, bags and bags and bags of blood they had given me. And he said, we're going to be sending you to another hospital. At this point, I had started uh, collecting fluid on my stomach. And um, I'll never forget this. And I've said this in another video, but I started having... Um... All right, sorry about that. My daughter walked in the front door and I uh, had to pause it for a second. But um, like I was saying... Uh, this, if you if you get triggered by things that are rather gross, and I mean it's not horrible, but just get thirty seconds past this part right here. But um, if you do want to know uh, about this part, I would listen because um, it's pretty important. Um, I was bleeding internally. I had varices that had burst, and uh, the one thing about varices bursting is that not only do you throw up and expel the blood uh, by vomiting. Um, but you also, the blood comes out the other end. And uh, when that happens, um, it is not a pretty sight. Uh, I mean, you are bleeding out of your back end. And your uh, gut starts to digest that blood. And the smell that comes from that, uh, there's no way for me really, I, can, I don't even know how even to describe it. 
uh, I would just say it smells like rotting flesh. And I could not stop uh, passing gas um, and, you know, uh, defecating blood. Um, there was uh, black and red um, blood that was coming out, um, and I was throwing up uh, red blood. Um, it was, it was uh, rather horrifying, uh, to say the least. I couldn't control myself any, any further. Um, yeah, I just, I kept going to the bathroom on myself. The nurse had to keep coming in and cleaning me up. Um, I remember they didn't want me getting out of the bed. They were worried I was going to fall down. And I, I asked them, please, can I have a toilet? Because they gave me a bedpan. And I said, please, please, just give me one of those little toilets, one of those little bucket toilets that you can put beside your bed. And the nurse uh, was really hesitant to do so. But my wife was there. I said, she'll help me. Just please, I don't want to have to go to the bathroom myself anymore. Because at this point, they had cleaned me up like 20 times. I'm not joking. Um, and she agreed, brought me the toilet, and I just basically sat on the toilet in there the rest of the night um, until the ambulance came at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning to pick me up, to take me up to Columbia, South Carolina, to, uh, to another hospital. Um, because like I said, they, did, they couldn't care for me at the hospital that I was at. Um, now they did, uh, they wanted me to go to MUSC in Charleston, uh, but this was back when we had that hurricane um, almost two years ago down there. And I was worried that if I went there, they weren't going to have enough staff. Um, and, you know, things were just gonna, weren't going to be well if I went down there in the middle of a hurricane. I wanted to go uh, to Columbia. So I went up there and um, was very, very, very ill. Um, this is when, uh, you know, the first time I really, really got um, ascites. Um, I had had ascites before uh, the first time I got sick, but it was nothing compared to this time. Um, I had so much fluid built up on my stomach. And I think that somebody, I, I think one of my parents might have um, a picture or two of me in that hospital. And I know I looked really, really bad when we were in there. Um, I'll never forget the, the room that I was in. There was actually a window. Um, and I don't know how many patients that my nurse had. I was in the ICU there. Uh, but there was a window that the nurse sat at a desk and she could look at, into my room um, the whole time I was in there. She had constant view of me. Um, and I've never seen that before in another hospital like that. It was um, the only one I've ever seen in that way. But uh, I arrived at that hospital and when I got there, uh, one of the first things that they did uh, is they drained off my stomach and removed a few liters of fluid. Um, and that fluid collected in my stomach in a matter of like two days. Uh, and when I say I, I was huge, um, they collected the fluid out and then all kinds of stuff happened from there. Uh, my gallbladder got distended. They were, they were talking about removing it. Um, they wouldn't let me eat at all because they were saying every day we're going to do surgery and then they never did. Um, that's the time that uh, they did an endoscopy on me. And um, when they went, uh, I woke up, and I'm thinking that, you know, everything's going to be okay. I wake up from that, and I'll never forget, I had defecated on myself, and I told the nurse, when I woke up, I, I felt something all over me. And uh, I told the nurse, I said, I'm going to need help. I need you to clean me up. And that was rather embarrassing. It, was, it had been going on for days. And she was like, okay, I'll clean you up. And then um, the doctor came in to talk with me after that, and he said, I'm sorry, but your stomach looks like hamburger meat. The varices were all over in there, and um, you know they I could, they couldn't stop the bleeding. Um, I don't remember how many blood transfusions they did at that point, but it was so many. Um, and that was the time you know I came home from that hospital stay and was deathly ill. That was the time they told me uh, my wife had come up there. Uh, she had left work early that day, and she came up there right around lunchtime. She was sitting there with me having some lunch and the hospitalist walked in the room and uh, she said, cause I had refused uh, the Dilaudid uh, IV injection the night before um, because I was starting to hallucinate off of it. And I told him I didn't want any more of that. Please stop giving it to me. So they stopped and that, that around lunchtime, the hospitalist walked in the room and she said, so I see here on your chart that you have refused to lot and she goes, why? And I told her, it's making me hallucinate. I don't want to take any more of that. Can we just please stop? And she said, we can. And since you've refused to take the Dilaudid, we're going to go ahead and send you home. And I was kind of confused. Uh, 
and she said, um, you need to go home and spend time with your family. And my wife is sitting right beside me when they said this, and I was like, you know, what's going on? And she said, you probably have about a year left to live. Um, you have cirrhosis and uh, your liver is failing um, and the varices uh, are bursting. Um, we could put bands on them, but they went into how if they put the bands on uh, that I could actually have um, uh, varices or other blood clots occur in the lungs. It was, I don't remember what all they said could happen, but they were, they were too afraid to do it. And uh, like I said, they basically told me you need to go home. They, they, they found out that I had portal hypertension when I was in the hospital. Um, but they set me up with a, um, a reference to MUSC to see a hepatologist. And when I went to go see the hepatologist, uh, that's when I found out that I, re I, I really did have cirrhosis, uh, that my liver looked horrible, um, and that, you know, I had the varices, that I had the blood clots. The, when, when I walked into the hepatologist's office, um, I had had an MRI done right before I arrived with contrast, and when I walked in, he picked up on the blood clots immediately. This is the first time I'd ever heard about it. Um, nobody else had picked up on it, and this is months later after, uh, you know, all the, my first time of getting really sick and ending up in the hospital. Um, I think it was May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Uh, we were about seven, eight months um, before they found the blood clots. And that's when uh, he set me up with uh, interventional radiology. I went and met with interventional radiology, and then they told me that they wanted to do a TIPS procedure. Um, a couple months later, I had that procedure, and it didn't work out. But that's a whole other story in itself. But like I said, um, you know, there were many things that were happening. Um, leading up to me finding out that I had cirrhosis. I just had no clue. And, um, you know, if you're having any of those problems, um, definitely please go see your doctor. Uh, you know, if you're throwing up any type of blood, any black coffee grinds, um, if you are having anything uh, like dark black, if you're having dark or black tarry stools, um, or either red uh, stools, um, that could be indicative of uh, varices burst. Um, there's a lot of things, um, you know, that you got to be careful about. Um, if you think that you're having any yellowing of the eyes, I did have jaundice when I was in the hospital during that period of time. Very, very dark urine. My, my urine was like dark, dark brown. Um, uh, and it had a very odd smell to it. Um, it's really hard to describe. If you've ever been really, really dehydrated and you urinate and, um, yeah, it's just got that really strong odor. Uh, that's what it was like. But when I tell you it was dark brown, I mean dark, dark brown, uh, like the color of my beard brown, um, like not opaque at all. You couldn't really see through it. Uh, very alarming. Um, you know, just all those things. If you have any of the things I just talked about, please go speak with a doctor. Um, you know, if they catch some of these things early enough, um, you know, they can treat them. And especially if you have burst varices, there's things they can do. They put bands on them. Um, there's a lot of stuff that they can do to help you. Uh, you do not want to let that go. Um, you know, every day I hear from people uh, you know, that are having problems, and it sounds just like things that I'm going through. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't go, and um, I'm, I'm begging with you guys. If any of you guys are having any of these problems, please go see a doctor. Please go to the hospital, um, because if you catch it early enough, you could potentially save your life, and every day matters. Every single day, and if even if they tell you you have three months more to live, um, that's three more months that you get to spend. Tell people that you love them. Uh, maybe get to apologize for some of the things that you've done, um, the lies that you told, or whatever it may be, the people you upset. Because, you know, the unfortunate thing about this is that we do tend to upset a lot of people. And uh, this is our chance to uh, rectify some stuff. And, um, you know, you want to be able to be here as long as you can. Um, so if you're having any of those issues, please, please, I'm pleading with you, please go see a doctor or go to the hospital. Um, you know, if it's in the middle of the night, just go to the emergency room. Uh, you just never know.
Um, and it's just not a good idea to get on Google and start looking at, you know, symptoms and stuff. If, if, first of all, if you've thrown up blood, you have to go to the hospital. You really have to go. Um, because, say, if you're, if you're bleeding internally, they're probably going to need to give you a blood transfusion. And, you know, the thing is, like I said, you might be able to prolong your life a little bit longer. And uh, every day that we have matters. And um, I love you guys. And for any of you that might be going through this, I, I want to see you here as long as you can be. So, with that said, guys, um, this video has gone on long enough. And uh, there's more to this. Um, I think I'm going to talk about the rest of it in tomorrow's video. Um, but for today, that's it. Uh, just want to let you guys know that I do love you guys all very much. And thank you so much for watching today's video. Um, there will be the live video coming up this Saturday. I'm going to do it at 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I would love to see you guys there. Um, it's a great time. Uh, we have some good laughs. The last time, there were a bunch of trolls in there. Um, so, uh, probably going to see if... Uh, if David will hop back on there and be my moderator again. So, David, I'm hoping that you're going to do that again for me. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to keep up with everything and get rid of those people that kept hopping in like that. But um, anyway, guys, y'all have a wonderful day today. Sorry that this is kind of a depressing talk, but it's an important one. And um, like I said, if you're having any of these kinds of problems, please go see a doctor. I'll finish up the rest of this video tomorrow. And with that said, I'll talk to y'all then. Bye-bye.